Should your age and your current level of disability affect your decision to go on a certain disease-modifying therapy for multiple sclerosis? Today, I'm going to show a very interesting study from Italy. It's a cross-sectional observational study comparing two disease-modifying therapies in the real world, Tecfidera, or dimethylfumarate, and Tysabri, or natalizumab. And which is better and for whom? And I think it addresses a very interesting idea that our intuition may actually lead us to make bad decisions. So I think a lot of people have an intuitive idea that they would want to treat a milder disease more conservatively. And so let's say you have multiple sclerosis, but you're not disabled. You don't have a lot of major symptoms. You may want to be more conservative and not take an aggressive disease-modifying therapy that may have rare but potentially very serious side effects, whereas someone with more aggressive multiple sclerosis who is more disabled may be more eager to go on the the strongest medication. But this study shows that that may be backwards and the healthy person with so-called milder MS or at least someone who isn't currently disabled may actually be the best candidate for a stronger disease modifying therapy. So we're going to look at these two medications. So dimethylfumarate or Tecfidera is considered to be a less potent disease modifying therapy. It's a twice a day pill and it can cause certain side effects such as flushing, diarrhea, and rarely lowering of the white blood cell count associated with certain infections. And I do have a separate video on Tecfidera if you want to take a look. Tysabri, on the other hand, natalizumab, is considered to be a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy. It's given as an infusion through the IV, usually once a month or every six weeks, and it works by blocking the white blood cells from getting into the central nervous system. And I do have a separate video on Tysabri if you want to take a look. Now, the problem with Tysabri is it's associated in very rare cases with an infection infection caused by the JC virus, which can actually infect the brain and cause a horrible disease called PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Take a look at that other video if you want to learn more about it. And so, of course, many people are reticent to go on Tysabri. Now, this study is not a randomized study. It's purely observational. And we'll take a look at who was in the study. So this just compares who is getting natalizumab or Tysabri and who is getting dimethylfumarate. And so on average, they were about 40 years old, so they were about the same age. The average age of onset was around 28 or 29, compared between the two groups. The people getting Tysabri had the disease for a little bit longer, disease duration of 13.7 years versus 11.4 years in the Tecfidera group. And that's because it was more likely to be a second line therapy. So Tecfidera was more likely to be the first drug, but in more cases, Tysabri was given after another drug was unsuccessful. Now, the people taking Tysabri were a little bit more disabled on average. They had an average EDSS score of 3.5. EDSS stands for Expanded Disability Status Scale, and it's a 0 to 10 scale used in research for disability in MS. 0 means no disability. An EDSS of 3 could be considered to be moderate disability. At an EDSS of 6, a cane is required to walk 100 meters, and I have a video going into more detail about the scoring. But for the Tysabri group, the average level of baseline disability was 3.5 versus only 2.5 in the Tecfidera group. And the researchers here argue that maybe they have it wrong, that the less disabled people should be more eager to go on Tysabri. The ARR, or annualized relapse rate, was about 0.2, or one relapse per five years on average, in both groups. Now, the interesting thing, really, is the level of baseline disability. But one point they make in the article is age, and you can can see that people who are older and who have had the disease for longer are more likely to have greater disability. And so this is just a plot, and you can see the different color coding of EDSS levels, and the black dots are higher levels of disability. And it's definitely true that people who are older and have had the disease for longer are more likely to have higher levels of disability. Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about age, but it is a factor. But more interesting to me is looking at the baseline level of disability. So what they're looking at here is something called confirmed disability progression. And so let's say you have a baseline EDSS of 3, moderate disability, and you worsen and you go see your doctor and you have an EDSS of 4. Well, there can be a lot of day-to-day -day fluctuation or you can have a relapse that later recovers, but let's say you go back to see your doctor six months later and you still have an EDSS of 4. That suggests you really worsened and that your progression of disability is confirmed by a subsequent exam. So that's what they're looking at here, confirmed disability progression. Now they look at it in 
two different ways. Let's take the people who are less disabled at baseline. Their EDSS is between 1 to 3, in other words, mild to moderate disability, versus those who have more baseline disability, EDSS of 3.5 to 7, so people who have moderate to severe disability. Now you can look at the survival curve. People start off with 100% of them not having disability progression, 1.0. And then as time goes on, more people have disability progression. But the green line, people taking Tysabri, are less likely to have disability progression compared to the blue line, Tecvidera. And it's actually a pretty significant difference. So for people who have less baseline disability, Tysabri is definitely more effective. And that makes sense. Tysabri is known to be a stronger medication, and that's been shown in multiple trials. But what if you look at the people who have more disability, who have a baseline EDSS of 3.5 to 7? Well, now the curves are slightly, essentially on top of each other. Tysabri isn't any better than Tecvidera. In fact, the blue line, Tecvidera, is actually slightly better, although it was really marginal. You can see the lines are essentially on top of each other. So it's almost as if the strongness of Tysabri no longer applies to people who have greater disability, at least in this particular study. So the healthier people, so to speak, with less disability at baseline were more likely to benefit from Tysabri, even if they were reluctant to go on it because of the risk of PML. Now, they tried looking at this in different ways. For instance, here, they tried to look at different things such as the disease duration or the age of onset of multiple sclerosis. And the point is, it didn't really matter. No matter how you looked at it, the people with less disability, EDSS of 1.0 to 3.0, Tysabri performed better. They were less likely to have disability progression. Whereas those with greater disability, it didn't really matter. Both drugs were essentially equally effective. Now, the authors talk about how Tecvidera, it's not exactly 100% well understood how it works. It does have effects of something called the NRF2 receptor and may have some uh, neuromodulation modulatory effects, and people thought that it could be effective in progressive MS, and they kind of speculate maybe that's why the people who may have greater disability do better on that, although to me it's not really proven. No one really knows exactly how Tecvidera works, and there are other studies suggesting that Tecvidera also works better in people who are younger and have lower levels of disability. But anyways, the point is that I think that acting very intuitively and just uh, using sort of an escalation model, in other words, saying, well, if I'm doing well, I'll stick with the more conservative medications and I'll only escalate to a stronger treatment later on if I need it, may be a backwards way of thinking. And an induction model or starting with a stronger medication up front may make a lot more sense. Although it's a difficult pill to swallow, taking a risk of a potentially serious side effect when you're doing very well with multiple sclerosis. So I'd be interested to know your thoughts. If you have low levels of disability, did you choose to go on a stronger medication or did you choose the more conservative option and why? And please let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.